Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, the first in the Edge of Risk series sponsored by Stanford Hospital and Clinics Risk Consulting. My name is Renee Bernard, and I'm a Director of Risk Management at Stanford University Medical Center. Today's topic is Medical Marijuana, Perspectives and Considerations in Clinical Practice. Our audience is a mix of Stanford University Medical Center practitioners and staff, as well as members of other organizations from around the country. Thank you for joining us. A few comments about today's webinar. This webinar is interactive in two ways. First, we'll be conducting polls for your opinions on various topics during the webinar. Polling options are located on the right lower panel of your screen. You'll be prompted to respond and notified when the polls close. Second, you may at any time throughout the webinar submit questions via the Q&A feature. We'll be collecting all questions and addressing them at the end of the webinar. You should have received a link to download the webinar toolkit, which includes the medical marijuana white paper, checklist, and policy framework guidance. Please be sure to download these documents. If you did not receive a link or you're having trouble downloading the documents, please notify us through the Q&A feature. And lastly, please take a brief moment to review our disclaimer, which is located on the screen. The opinions expressed, discussions undertaken, and materials provided as part of this presentation do not represent any official position of Stanford University or any of its affiliates, including Stanford University Medical Center, its faculty, staff, or employees. I have two esteemed colleagues with me today that I'd like to introduce to you. Keith Humphreys is the Acting Director at the Veterans Health Administration Center for Healthcare Evaluation and a Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford University School of Medicine. He specializes in research in addictive disorder treatment and prevention. Keith has extensive experience in the formation of federal drug policy, having served as a member of distinguished commissions in the areas of mental health and substance abuse. He recently spent a year as Senior Policy Advisor in the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. We are very fortunate to have Keith with us to share his expertise in the area of federal drug policy. Welcome, Keith. Thank you, Renee. Happy to be here. We are also fortunate to be joined by Dr. Brian Bowman, our Chief of Staff here at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Renee. A little background on Dr. Bowman. He's an anesthesiologist and also trained in internal medicine. He's been our chief of staff at Stanford Hospital and Clinics for about three years now. He is also a member of the adjunct clinical faculty at Stanford University. Dr. Bo Dr. Bowman has joined us today to provide the perspective and considerations of hospital physicians. Now that you know us, we would like to know more about you. Please pick the response that describes you best. Are you a healthcare risk manager, an attorney, a physician, or other hospital stakeholders such as security services, pharmacy, nursing? Great, it looks like many of you are responding. So we're going to take a look at our learning objectives for today. We're going to explore the issues that are relevant to healthcare organizations in considering policy and procedure for managing patient expectations around the use of medical marijuana. We're going to discuss questions on the emerging trends in marijuana regulation, why physicians cannot prescribe marijuana, the types of delivery systems patients use to administer it, and we'll also discuss the difference between a recommendation and a prescription. And finally, we'll identify existing hospital policies that likely preclude the use of medical marijuana in most clinical settings. Ultimately, this discussion is not to argue the merit of the laws or the medical legitimacy of the individuals who claim protection under them. Our goal is to provide you a broad overview of the relevant issues as you strive to create your own processes within your organization. So I'd like to begin by describing the plant we've all come to discuss today, marijuana. It's one of the most recognizable plants in the world. 
It contains over 400 identifiable compounds. Some are medicinal and some are not. It also contains 60 different cannabinoids. The most famous due to its psychoactive effects is tetrahydrocannabinol. We'll just call it THC. The plant has been historically controversial because of its highly intoxicating properties and due to its federal categorization as an illegal drug. This controversy is now an ongoing debate as several states have allowed voters to determine whether or not marijuana should be provided to patients as a treatment option. Not all states define their regulations around marijuana equally. They vary in the types of patients allowed access to use it and how much those patients can possess. And they also vary in the management of registry databases, which would identify who is ac accessing marijuana under their state law. Additionally, those who oppose the idea of medical marijuana express concern that these state laws circumvent the process established through the FDA for the development of medication. So the result is a heavily debated legal framework, which catalyzes a different set of issues in the healthcare arena. Let's take a look at the overarching federal framework. The very important federal law is the Controlled Substances Act. We'll refer to it as the CSA. The CSA is federal drug policy intended to combat recreational use and abuse and the serious crimes associated with it. Its other purpose is to legitimize certain substances for medical practice. The Act lists five categories of restricted drugs, and they are organized by their perceived medical acceptance, abuse potential, and ability to produce dependence. The categorization of substances is managed by the DEA and the FDA, although Congress can schedule substances on its own if it wishes. Substances are categorized as Schedule I if they've been deemed to have no medical use and a high potential for abuse and dependence. Scientific research of Schedule I drugs requires specific authorization by the DEA. Heroin, PCP, and crack are all examples of Schedule I drugs. Substances are categorized as Schedule II if they have been deemed to have safe and acceptable medical use and a high potential for abuse and dependence. Some examples of Schedule II drugs are opiates and powdered cocaine. Marijuana is a Schedule I controlled substance under the CSA. This means that scientific research of its proposed medical value requires authorization by the DEA or that the DEA would have to agree to reschedule marijuana as a Schedule II drug. The DEA has been very clear, there is no present intention to reclassify marijuana as a Schedule II drug. Therefore, it's important to remember that the CSA makes dispensing, possessing, selling, purchasing, or prescribing marijuana a federal offense. In spite of federal laws making marijuana a Schedule I controlled substance, advocates have drawn the public's attention to the proposed medicinal value of marijuana. Advocates in this arena are a mix of individuals. Some advocate with the goal of making all marijuana use legal, while others are genuinely focused on providing a treatment option for severely ill patients. This can be seen with the organizations listed here on this slide. Some are very bent towards legalization, such as the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. This organization is also referred to as NORMAL. Americans for Safe Access promote education and research of therapeutic uses of marijuana. And they really appear to be more medicine and patient focused. However, a look into their history reveals that at their inception, they were actually closely affiliated with NORMAL. This further confuses the issues for the general public because the intent behind the advocacy is not always clear. So therefore, the intent behind medical marijuana laws is also not always clear. We provide this information to you to point out where some of the controversy in this topic arises. In any case, these advocates have in recent years successfully gotten medical marijuana laws onto the ballot. 
The result is that we now have 15 states with medical marijuana laws. So how is this possible in light of the federal CSA? It's possible because the CSA allows for states to regulate controlled substances as long as their regulation does not create a positive or direct legal conflict with the CSA's intent, which again was to combat recreational use and abuse of illicit substances and the crimes associated with it. The U.S. Supreme Court has found that the, de found that the determination of direct legal conflict depends on the intent of the laws. So far, these 15 states and Washington, D.C. have not been found to directly conflict with the intent of the CSA. Again, the intent of the CSA is to combat recreational drug abuse. The intent of the state laws appears to be to provide a medical option to severely ill patients. So have these laws legalized marijuana? Well, no, states cannot legalize marijuana. States cannot legalize what is a federal offense. They can exercise their right to remove their own state criminal penalties associated with the provision and use of marijuana under certain conditions, such as with a physician's recommendation to a patient. This is referred to as decriminalization. Now there is wide variation in these laws. They are inconsistent in the medical conditions they identify as treatable with marijuana. For example, California's Compassionate Use Act of 1996 has significantly broader language than Arizona's law, which was passed in 2010. It can be said that in recent years, the laws have become stricter with regard to the types of patients identified under the law, but the lack of uniformity remains. Some of those opposed to the law express concern that these laws will inevitably lead to legalization for marijuana for recreational use, such as with alcohol. Additionally, these laws create an end run around the established process for development of medicine through the FDA. Therefore, there is concern that these laws promote unsafe medicine and reduce the credibility of medical practitioners in the eyes of the public. Let's take a look at the most common medical conditions cited in association with state medical marijuana laws. The majority of state laws allow the use of marijuana for treatment of many other conditions besides the ones you see listed here. For example, again, California's law is extremely broad with respect to the types of patients who are allowed access to medical marijuana meaning any persistent or chronic condition which the patient reports limits just one activity of daily living is enough for a patient to gain access to marijuana under California's law. So what this means to us in the clinical setting is that organizations will encounter many types of patients who are using marijuana, and they will not all look the same, and they will not all look severely ill. This is why it is so important for organizations to begin having discussions about medical marijuana. It's likely that there is already a subset of their patients using marijuana. Another emerging trend arises in the federal arena. Recently, there has been federal recognition of the impact state medical marijuana laws have in the community and also in the VA healthcare system. The 2009 memo from the Deputy Attorney General supports the commitment of the federal government to the enforcement of the CSA. The core priority of the federal government is still to prosecute significant drug traffickers, including those who traffic marijuana. However, the Department of Justice is also committed to making efficient and rational use of its limited investigative and prosecutorial resources. So in short, the federal government's focus is toward prosecution of conduct that is not in clear and unambiguous compliance with applicable state law. For example, a marijuana dispensary that is engaged in tax evasion and cocaine dealing would be closed down by the DEA. The Veterans Health Administration has recently established guidelines for management of veteran patients who have obtained medical marijuana recommendations from non-VA physicians. Veteran patients using medical marijuana are no longer precluded from participating in VA pain management and substance abuse programs. However, VA physicians cannot provide recommendations for use 
of medical marijuana to their patients. And the VA does not provide marijuana itself under any circumstances. The CSA explicitly precludes prescription of marijuana. Likewise, state laws which attempt to decriminalize prescriptions are preempted. And preemption means that the law is struck down or has no legal effect. Physicians in states with medical marijuana laws may only provide either a verbal or written recommendation to patients according to their applicable state law. At this time, we'd like to hear from our attendees again, so we're going to open the polls and ask you another question. What do you think of state laws that allow access to marijuana? We'd like you to pick the response that, clo that is closest to your opinion. Do you think these laws appropriately provide access to patients who feel they benefit medically from marijuana? Do these laws promote unsafe medicine? Do these laws are these laws being abused by people who do not use it for medicinal purposes? Or do you think the laws are too restrictive? Great, it looks like many of you are responding. Now I'm going to turn it over to Keith Humphreys. He's going to discuss some serious concerns not always so well publicized in the media. He's going to dis discuss concerns related to non-FDA approved medication, risks associated with smoking and recommending smoking marijuana. We'll talk a little bit about the current delivery systems, as well as the latest scientific study in cannabinoids and delivery systems. Keith? Thank you, Renee, and hello to everyone who's listening in today. Uh, when people look at medical marijuana, often the first question they have is, can you really get an effective medication from a plant in nature? And as most of you know, the answer to that question is definitely yes, you can. Uh, if you take a look at the slide on the left there, that uh, pretty flower is called foxglove, from which you can derive digitalis, used to treat congestive heart failure and certain arrhythmias. Willow uh, tree bark has salicin in it, um, which is related to acetosalicylic acid, and that was originally how we got aspirin. Atropine comes by way of the belladonna plant. Atropine, as most of you will know, increases parasympathetic activity and has many uses, for example, in the treatment of bradycardia. And the same um, is true of cannabinoids, which are a component of the marijuana plant, or cannabis sativa, as it's formerly known. But whether a a plant in its raw form uh, includes some components with a possible medical benefit is a separate question of whether the FDA would approve a raw plant. In the U.S., we have a long-established process overseen by the Food and Drug Administration for the development and legitimization of medication. This FDA process is intended to ensure that the public is provided with safe and effective medications which are standardized as to administration, dosing, and purity. Historically, the FDA has not approved raw plants as medicine, and there's no reason to expect that this will change. In contrast, Marinol, which is a standard, pure, synthetic version of one component of the marijuana plant, THC, has been approved by the FDA. But that's obviously a different uh, far cry from approving a raw plant. In terms of medical benefits, there is some evidence of medical efficacy to uh, various cannabinoids, uh, such as in the treatment of pain, in, in suppressed appetite, and in uh, spasticity, like in uh, multiple sclerosis. THC has been shown to benefit some patients with chemotherapy-induced nausea. It has also been beneficial to some patients who have muscle spasms associated with multiple sclerosis and other conditions. And THC is not the only compound in the plant that might be medically useful. Although the studies are very early and, and, and uh, weak at this point, there, there are, is some suggestion that cannabidiol, which is another part of the plant, uh, may have some use in treating aggressive tumors. And interestingly, cannabinol doesn't have the intoxicating effects of THC. So there may be things in the plant that have value that, that aren't uh, necessarily as, uh, as psychoactive as THC is. It's worth noting that no study of cannabinoids has found extremely large clinical benefits. So we're not talking about blockbuster drugs in terms of the impact they might have. 
And it's also worth noting that all the benefits uh, that have been found so far can also be produced by other FDA-approved medications. Uh, the bottom line is that you know cannabinoids should be researched for medical value. They are being researched for medical value, and we will probably get some more medicines uh, out of them in the future. So there are some risks here, though, some health risks. Uh, and they can come from the substance itself as well as how it's uh, consumed. For, and the most common ways uh, uh, cannabis is consumed is through smoking or ingestion. So first off, your medical audience, this will not be news to you, uh, inhaling hot smoke is not good for the body. Uh, everyone knows that. And that it's hard on the respiratory system to inhale hot smoke and burning gases, whether what's being inhaled is tobacco or cannabis or wood smoke. And it probably goes without saying the FDA has never approved a smoked medication. Uh, for one, it's difficult to administer safe regulated doses of medication in a smoked form. Second, the harmful byproducts of smoking create risk of entirely new health problems. Uh, it sh uh, should be noted that smoked marijuana contains some of the same compounds as tobacco smoke. Finally, uh, in my field of research, which is addiction, we see that marijuana, like any other psychoactive drug, can instill physical dependence. And that's particularly likely when the mode of administration delivers the drugs rapidly to the brain, as is the case when you smoke it. Now, in terms of the dependence, people who get physically dependent on marijuana, epidemiologic data shows that about 9% of people who use marijuana will become physically dependent on it, be using it every single day. And marijuana dependency is a common reason people seek voluntary drug treatment. You see that even in parts of the world, like the Netherlands, where there are no criminal penalties for using marijuana. In other words, it's not just you know, uh, pressure from court systems that drives people to seek treatment for marijuana dependence. It's subjective distress uh, and, and feeling that it's, it's impairing functioning. Some physicians, in my experience, find it hard to believe that marijuana can be addictive, and that may be because among more highly educated segments of the population, it's much more common that, for example, in college or in medical school, marijuana use was an occasional behavior that didn't result in dependence. Addicted and heavy users of marijuana tend to be located in poor and more disenfranchised communities. And depending on your life experiences and your clinical experiences, you may not have a, a, a strong connection to that community and therefore may not have seen as many people dependent on marijuana, but they do exist, many of them. One of the implications of physical dependence as a, as a consequence of, of sustained cannabis use is that sometimes it's hard for both the patient and the physician to determine whether the reason medical marijuana provides short-term relief is because it's a medical effect or because it's simply relieving withdrawal symptoms, much as does the first cigarette a smoker uses in the morning. You know, when a, when a heavy smoker wakes up and smokes that first cigarette, they may feel energized and they may feel less anxious. But we wouldn't say that makes the cigarette medicine. We would say that person is dependent on nicotine and therefore consuming the drug again takes those symptoms away. And you can see that same phenomenon with marijuana. The, the American College of Physicians has repeatedly and explicitly stressed the need for safer uh, cannabinoid uh, delivery system, safer than smoking. Uh, the chronic use of smoke marijuana is associated with increased risks of some cancers, like testicular cancer, lung damage, bacterial pneumonia, poor pregnancy outcomes, and more severe course of mental illness. Marijuana users are also more likely to be tobacco users. Some, some people smoke marijuana and tobacco together, so one of these addictions may therefore help feed the other. Those of you who work in psychiatric settings are probably aware of a, a spate of new research, European research, showing a relationship between chronic marijuana use and worse course of psychotic spectrum illnesses like schizophrenia. And by worse course, I mean the person has their first psychotic episode at an earlier age and more severe psychotic uh, symptoms throughout their lifetime. Not all the risks here are associated with health per se, there's also the risk of physicians being caught as figureheads promoting a behavior that is unfriendly or unhealthy, excuse me. A physician friend of mine was recently in Venice Beach, California, and a man came up to him on roller skates and said, I am a Cush doctor and that's my clinic over there. Would you like a marijuana recommendation? Now, however you feel about the current policy and the law, you will probably agree that such things do not raise the credibility of medicine with the public. 
older members in the medical field will remember vividly the era when most physicians smoked tobacco cigarettes and cheerfully rated camels their favorite brand. The tobacco industry built on this foundation with deceptive advertisements like the ones you see in the slide linking doctors with smoking, and that damaged medicine's credibility. Those bitter historical experiences, supplemented by decades of subsequent research evidence showing that smoke inhalation of all forms can cause acute and long-term respiratory damage, make many physicians wary of recommending a smoked medicine. Anti-smoking values are so well established in medicine that one could safely revise the adage to read, where there's smoke, there's a worried doctor. Uh, for, so for many of the reasons I've just discussed, most physicians would not prescribe to smoke medicine even if it were legal. Um, you can see the results there of a, a study by Brown University of 960 physicians, two-thirds of which did not want um, medical prescriptions of marijuana to be legal. And I'll just make this concrete, the difference between um, the use of a, a component and, the, and, the, and marijuana. I'm just going to take a recent research finding and work through it. California Pacific research team recently discovered a preliminary finding, and it's very preliminary, but let's assume it, it pans out, that cannabidiol may have some beneficial value in the treatment of certain aggressive tumors. It wouldn't follow from that that we should immediately start giving um, smoking marijuana to get rid of aggressive tumors. Why not? Well, the research team noted that the correct dose of cannabidiol uh, could, could not be obtained through smoking marijuana. We'd never be able to titrate it that accurately. And also, the proposed effective dose is, is incredibly large compared to what is generally delivered through smoking marijuana. Also, you'd have a contraindication in the sense that in consuming the marijuana, people would also be consuming THC, which has intoxicating effects, which some patients find aversive. I mean, as I mentioned, about 9% of people who use marijuana become dependent on it, and that's a significant side effect that physicians are going to have to weigh. I just note also about the dependency data. Sometimes people underplay the effect uh, or the reality of the addiction to marijuana by saying, well, it's psychologically addictive, but it's not physically addictive. But both our psychology and addiction are represented in physical structures in the brain. So that is a distinction without a difference. There are other ways of delivering marijuana, such as through vaporizing devices or ingesting it with food. The vaporizer is an alternative approach to smoking. The device heats marijuana to temperatures which releases THC in a fume which the person then inhales. Some recent research conducted at University of California, San Francisco, indicates this method allows the THC to be inhaled with, without most of the carcinogens found in marijuana cigarettes. Other research has found, though, that the level of ammonia released is still at a toxic level. So this isn't perfect, but it is safer than just smoking a hot uh, cigarette, a marijuana cigarette. That technology, uh, vaporization technology, may make some physicians eventually more comfortable with prescribing THC, but others will have the opposite reaction because a purified, deeply inhalable, and therefore more fast-acting form of the drug is going to be more addictive. An al al alternative uh, method of uh, taking the drug is through ingestion with food products. That gets rid of smoking completely off the table. And probably it's less addictive because when we absorb psychoactive drugs from the gut, it's a slower action, and slower action usually means less addictive. So those are certainly good things. You still, though, do have the problems posed uh, with regard to impurity and, and uh, difficulty in setting a dose. Given that there is an FDA-approved synthetic form of THC called Marinol or Dronabinol, it seems that that might be a safer route rather than ingesting the drug. Um, and so just another example to say there are other FDA-approved medications that seem able to get whatever you might get from uh, cannabis. Now, U.S. physicians may in the near future see a, a safe alternative to smoke marijuana called Sativex. It's created from uh, a standardized strains mixing cannabidol and THC, which have been um, extracted from the marijuana plant. The development of Sadbex began in 1998 in Great Britain. The British government gave a pharmaceutical company approval to breed and grow marijuana plants under controlled conditions where they could standardize their content. 
The goal of the research was to maximize the plant's therapeutic value and minimize its intoxicating and dependence-producing effects. From this research, an oral spray was developed, which consists of cannabidiol and THC in a specifically blended formula. Sativex is now approved for medical use in Canada and in Great Britain. It's in phase three trials uh, in the United States. If approved here, it would be used in the treatment of cancer pain. As I mentioned, the FDA is not going to approve just a raw plant, uh, you know, out of the forest as a medication, but there are new guidelines the FDA has that can approve a botanical um, a medication. And, and they have approved at least one that I know of, Virgin, which is composed of green tea leaves. So Sativex would apply under those um, under those standards. Whether it produces good results, including not being addictive, that's, that will be determined in the clinical trials, and presumably if it meets those standards, it would be approved by FDA, just like any other substance, or any other medication. In any event, the people making Sativex have clearly grasped something important about medicine, which is you can't become associated with the status and trust society bestows on physicians without at the same time accepting the scientific and ethical rigor to which doctors uh, adhere. Sativex is the furthest of long of cannabinoid, uh, new emerging cannabinoid medications, but it's worth noting there are dozens of clinical trials underway and lots of research on the cannabinoid system in the brain. So as I said, I suspect there will be some other medications coming in the future. Thank you, Keith, for those important policy and health and clinical considerations. We're going to conduct another poll. Now, the DEA has made it clear that recategorizing marijuana would not be safe for the public. However, the medical community has asked for recategorization for further study of marijuana. We'd like to know what you, the audience, thinks about this. Based on what you know and have heard so far, do you think marijuana should be recategorized as a Schedule II drug to promote further scientific study? Again, a Schedule II drug is one that is deemed to have safe and accepted medical use, but with a high potential for abuse and dependence. And it would place marijuana in a class with opiates and cocaine, powdered cocaine, not crack cocaine. And it looks like we're getting quite a few responses from our medical community in our audience. And It looks like the overwhelming majority of you feel that there would be benefit in recategorizing marijuana as a Schedule II drug to promote further scientific study in the medical community. We thank you for your responses. Now we'll hear from Dr. Brian Bowman on physician's perspective and considerations related to recommending medical marijuana. He will then outline the policy considerations a healthcare facility will need to grapple with in response to patient expectation to use medical marijuana in the clinical setting. Brian? Thanks, Renee, and good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to thank Keith for sharing his really extensive experience and expertise on these issues with us this morning. I myself uh, do not claim any special expertise in the science and law of marijuana use. I'm here more to offer a perspective as a hospital chief of staff who's been engaged over the past couple of years in assisting my own hospital and our clinicians to adapt to the changing status of marijuana in our society and our medical care systems. More and more physicians and hospitals are encountering this new population of patients who either desire or have already been granted access to marijuana under their state laws. But the differing legal treatment of marijuana by various states and by the federal government leaves gray areas that are confusing to clinicians and which may in some cases create legal vulnerabilities for them. So let's first explore the implications of medical marijuana laws for the relationship between medical marijuana patients and their physicians. It is important for individual physicians to understand the basics of medical marijuana laws and form their own personal policies as to how they'll choose to interact with their patients. As we'll see, attempting to make these decisions on an impromptu, ad hoc, or uninformed basis can damage the physician-patient relationship or even lead to legal jeopardy for physicians and patients both. So one of our goals today is to understand how federal law, your specific state law, the physician-patient relationship, and quality of care considerations all interact to determine the boundaries of what's legally 
ethically and medically permissible. First, let's explore how the federal law, the Controlled Substances Act, affects physicians. We've already heard that marijuana is classified as a Schedule I narcotic, meaning there's no valid medical use recognized by the federal government. So this, along with the fact that marijuana is not an FDA-approved medication, is the basis for the fact that physicians cannot legally prescribe as opposed to recommend marijuana. And regardless of your state lo state's laws, the federal government under the Supremacy Clause retains the right to interdict and prosecute in federal court the sale, possession, or use of marijuana for any reason. Although the Obama administration has made it clear that they will not expend federal resources to prosecute marijuana-related activities that are legal under state law, that is a policy rather than a federal law, and so it could relatively easily be changed in the future. Does that mean that physicians who recommend medical marijuana are at risk of federal prosecution, or at least losing their DEA license? No. On the contrary, physicians may rest assured that they are free from federal prosecution in communicating their medical opinions regarding marijuana to their patients. A discussion between physician and patient about medical marijuana is protected as professional speech under the First Amendment, as was recently affirmed in 2003 when the U.S. Supreme Court let stand a Ninth Circuit ruling on this specific issue. But the caveat here is that this may not apply to certain other activities surrounding marijuana, such as directing a patient to a specific dispensary, discussing price and types of marijuana, and that sort of activity. Certainly supplying marijuana directly to a patient clearly goes beyond both free speech considerations and the scope of any state medical marijuana laws those kinds of activities would seem at best imprudent um, and could invite federal attention on the basis that they violate or they constitute aiding and abetting a violation of federal drug laws. With regard to state law, it's really very important to know the specifics of your own state statute because state marijuana laws can be very specific regarding the circumstances under which medical marijuana may be recommended. While we, who of course are citizens as well as, as physicians, remain free under the First Amendment to recommend any, rec any medication for any reason we think appropriate, this may not protect our patients from state prosecution should they be found to be using marijuana outside of their state's boundaries. And similarly for physicians, despite our First Amendment free speech protection, there remain legal hazards other than a federal criminal prosecution. Because first, the medical marijuana law may, as it does in California, specify that medical marijuana recommendations may be made only under criteria that would apply to a, quote, reasonable and prudent physician. And you see the larger problem is that the recommendation for marijuana in the context of a physician-patient relationship constitutes the practice of medicine, which is, as you know, a licensed and heavily regulated activity. So reckless or ill-considered recommendations for medical marijuana, as with any other drug or substance, could be construed as so far below the standard of care that your medical license could be put at jeopardy. Even if your state licensing board has not been active to date in monitoring medical marijuana prescribers, keep in mind this could change at any time. State medical board disciplinary action certainly is plausible, especially in the case of physicians who are willing for a price to routinely recommend medical marijuana for large numbers of patients with little or no discrimination or documentation of the justifications for their recommendation. Thus, it would seem wise at a minimum to fulfill the same requirements as exist for prescriptions involving other controlled substances. In California, the medical board specifies that marijuana recommendations fall under the same standards as other medications and that physicians must take the following steps, taking a history and conducting a good faith examination, developing a treatment plan, providing informed consent, periodically reviewing the treatment's efficacy, uh, obtaining consultations as needed, and most importantly, keeping proper records supporting the decision to recommend the use of medical marijuana. Well, that's all just good medical practice and really is mandated by sound medical ethics as well as state laws and quality regulators such as state medical boards. So to sum up, if a patient asks about uh, prescribing medical marijuana, what's an ethical and conscientious physician to do? Well, I would start with first principles. The foundation of the patient-physician relationship is based on trust and open communication. So a judgmental attitude or dishonesty of any kind from either patient or physician is poisonous and will impair both trust and communication. That said, 
We must recognize that as with many other medical issues, it's natural that opinions will vary among practitioners. Based on studies in the literature, case reports, their own clinical experience, and recommendations from medical authorities of various sorts, some physicians may come to believe that medical marijuana is a perfectly reasonable recommendation in a variety of medical situations, while others may believe with Keith that it's virtually never indicated. And that's okay, that's medicine. But either way, physicians may rest assured that they are free from prosecution in communicating their reasonable medical opinions to their patients. They should be free from worry about federal or state prosecution, as well as disciplinary action by their state licensure boards if they follow these four practices. First, avoid straying outside the bounds of a strictly medical discussion. Second, formally recommend ma medical marijuana only within the bounds of your applicable state law. Third, use appropriate and defensible medical judgment with an appropriate risk-benefit discussion with the patient. And finally, document this aspect of the patient's medical care, the same as you would any other, only more so. So that was a review of medical marijuana laws as they apply to uh, the relationship between physicians and patients. But now let's look at the implications of, of medical marijuana laws as they relate to hospitals. Just as with individual physicians, it's wise for hospitals in states with medical marijuana laws to carefully consider how their particular state law may create issues for them and their patients. Then policies can be adopted that anticipate and address those issues proactively. Let's start by assuming that the hospital's first impulse is to accommodate the wishes of its patients, which is certainly a good principle of patient set, good first principle of patient-centric medicine. But then we're left to confront the practical issues of mer medical marijuana use in the hospital setting. For most hospitals, first consideration is how a patient's presumed wish to use medical marijuana might be precluded by no smoking policies. Of course, the Joint Commission has recommended that all hospitals be smoke-free, and I believe the vast majority of us have followed that advice. So this straight-off rules out smoking marijuana anywhere on most hospital grounds. Regarding an, an alternative means of administration for medical marijuana, vaporization, most hospitals will find this problematic as well because of the high temperatures that are required for vaporization devices to work. In fact, the Joint Commission also requires that all electronic devices brought from home be inspected for safety by clinical and biomedical engineering. And since the heating element in vaporizers reaches temperatures upwards of 400 degrees Fahrenheit, it's quite unlikely they're going to be approved for use in a potentially oxygen-enriched environment such as exists in most hospitals, which leaves ingestion of marijuana, such as via marijuana brownies, as the only feasible means of administration in most hospital settings. And so we arrive at the next issue, which is development of clear organizational policies and procedures on this whole topic of medical marijuana. Even if there is a practical means of administrating, of, excuse me, administering medical marijuana, such as by ingestion, or if for whatever reason smoking and or vaporization are feasible in your hospital, your organization will still have to play an important role in determining whether and how medical marijuana is used and will also have the responsibility to educate staff and provide clear guidelines. Medical marijuana may fit into the framework of hospital policies regarding patients using their own medications that are brought from home during their hospital stay. But remember, marijuana is not an FDA-approved medication, so in this case it would be more akin to something like Eastern, alternative, natural, or herbal types of medications. And with those kinds of substances, also considered medicinal by patients, Concerns include issues of dosing, possible side effects, and adverse interactions with other traditional medications. As far as I'm aware, there are no documented significant issues of marijuana interactions with FDA-approved medications, nor are there realistic concerns about acute toxicity in most situations. But there are certainly known side effects, including intoxication, that are of legitimate concern, and that concern should be addressed when policies regarding marijuana use are constructed. By the way, keep in mind that all of these considerations would apply even if use of marijuana was completely decriminalized in your state. The last concern is based on the fact that at least so far, non-medical marijuana does remain fully illegal in every state. So what is a hospital to do with marijuana brought in by a patient who claims it is medicinal? 
Traditionally, as a clearly illegal substance, marijuana brought to a hospital or found on a mission would be destroyed by hospital security. But in states where medical marijuana is allowed, hospital policies should provide for a determination of whether any marijuana possessed by a patient should be considered as a legal as opposed to illegal drug. If allowed under state law, presumably it would be treated similarly to any other medications which a patient brings to the hospital, but which, but which are not going to be used during that hospital stay. And in such instances, medical marijuana should be kept in a safe place and then returned on discharge. However, if the patient is unable to demonstrate under your state law that his or her marijuana qualifies as medicinal, it should likely be treated as any other illegal drug, which means that it would be confiscated by hospital security and destroyed. An organization would have to carefully consider whether or not to involve law enforcement. As a general rule of thumb, our role as physicians and healthcare institutions does not include a law enforcement function, except in very unusual circumstances. But on the other hand, it would surely be inappropriate and could create legal and liability issues for the hospital to return an illegal substance to a patient on discharge. So to summarize, most healthcare organizations will find it very difficult to accommodate their patient's desire to use medical marijuana during a stay in the hospital. And this is largely for the practical reasons described. Since some of these patients will truly believe that medical marijuana is vital to their health, it's important that patients understand this so they do not feel disrespected or take hospital policies as in any way punitive or judgmental. And of course, patients and their physicians do have the option of trying alternatives such as Marinol and perhaps someday soon Sativex if it is approved in the U.S. during their hospitalizations. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Renee to conclude and facilitate the question and answer session. Thank you, Brian. As we can see, medical marijuana as it relates to the clinical setting requires careful considerations by physicians and hospitals. This is not an issue that's going to go away, and if anything, it will remain controversial. There is a percentage of society that is becoming comfortable with the use of marijuana, but like Keith pointed out, there is a lot of information about marijuana that is not publicized by the media, but that healthcare providers and organizations should be informed of. Thank you both for your valuable insight. And that ends our discussion. We're going to move to our question and answer session, but first, just a few reminders. Don't forget to download and review the Medical Marijuana Toolkit. Instructions for download were provided in the registration email. If you are unable to access the toolkit, you may email us at riskmanagement at stanfordmed.org. Also, please save the date to participate in the next Edge of Series Ed Edge of Risk series webinar. The topic is The Active Shooter, Practical Considerations for the New Threat in Healthcare. That webinar is scheduled for April 20th. So let's begin our question and answer session. We've been collecting your questions, and um, I think we're going to start off with a, a question that uh, we'll have Keith address. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. All right, the first question is, uh, is it really so that people um, will show withdrawal symptoms uh, if they cease using uh, marijuana? And the answer is yes, they often will. There are, there's great genetic variation in how people respond to all the psychoactive substances, as, as I'm sure you've seen in your career. For example, uh, if you prescribe a short course of pain medication, um, most people will uh, stop using it without any withdrawal, but there are some patients who will show, even after a few weeks, some withdrawal symptoms from the opiates. And you see that in uh, cannabis as well. Um, and, the, and the withdrawal symptom characteristically, or the withdrawal syndrome, is the opposite of what you see when the person's got the drug at a high level in their blood. And so that would be things like you would see sleeplessness, anxiety, agitation, and suppressed appetite. So just as there are heavy drinkers who wake up and need a drink in the morning to relieve withdrawal, and there are heavy tobacco smokers who need that first um, hit of tobacco, there's also a population of people who've been using marijuana for a long time and wake up in the morning and need to consume that to bring the withdrawal symptoms under control. Thank you, Keith. I'm going to we have a couple questions that we're going to have Dr. Bowman go ahead and respond to, and then uh, I'm going to take a question after that. So go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Okay, I have a question, which is, what studies have identified any risks of secondhand marijuana smoke? 
And I can't cite chapter and verse on this. I think that um, it's understandable that someone might be skeptical of claims of health risks with marijuana, given the long history of really wildly overblown claims about the risks of marijuana over the past several decades. However, we do need to still be reasonable and prudent as physicians. And what we do know is that known carcinogens are found in marijuana smoke. Um, and so it's obvious that that could be a hazard. Um, population studies, I'm not aware that we've shown uh, actual higher incidence of, of carcinoma of the lung or that sort of uh, illness in marijuana smokers, but that's a difficult study to perform. Um, and I don't think that that means that there's no risk. I think that a prudent physician would conclude that anyone who smokes carcinogens is putting themselves at higher risk. The other main uh, concern with smoke, of course, is bronchitis and, and asthma and COPD type illnesses. And again, uh, I don't know of population studies that have proven that medical, mar or excuse me, that any kind of marijuana smoking can cause those uh, diseases, but it just stands to reason given that other forms of smoke have been shown to cause those diseases, that it's unlikely that marijuana smoke is uh, the exception to the rule. Um, like anything else, uh, for example, uh, uh, exposing yourself to smoke from a fireplace very infrequently is very unlikely to cause long-term or chronic illness. However, uh, frequent daily use or exposure to smoke from marijuana, wood smoke, or cigarettes is likely to cause damage to the lungs just based on uh, fundamental medical principles. Okay, I'm gonna take a, a really um, quick question here. And, and we got a question that says, in what states is medical marijuana legal? So I wanna start by saying, in no states is medical marijuana legal, but 15 states in Washington, D.C. have decriminalized or removed their state penalties for use for identified patients with identified medical conditions who were working in collaboration with a physician who's provided a recommendation. And so I will list the states that have decriminalized medical marijuana. Again, in California in 1996, then there was Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Maine, Nevada, Vermont, Rhode Island, New Mexico, Michigan, Arizona, New Jersey, and again, uh, Washington, D.C. So those are our 15 states in D.C. that have decriminalized medical marijuana within their states. And after that, I think we're going to go ahead and we have another question for um, Keith. So I'll let you go ahead, Keith. So we have a question of how the 9% addiction rate for marijuana compares with other drugs. Um, the first thing to say is the addiction rate of any substance is never entirely a matter of pharmacology. So, for example, most people who smoke tobacco are addicted. That's partly, though, because tobacco is legal. It's widely available. Until we started taxing it, it was cheap. People offered you tobacco uh, casually again before attitudes changed. So I, I can't tell you in a um, sort of in a lab sense of whether the addiction rate for cannabis is different for other substances because we don't live in a lab. We live in a world with certain norms and different rates of supply of the substances and, and different ideas about uh, what uh, should be used. Among, um, um, among what we do know, I'll just tell you, if you, if you look at um, drugs like LSD, for example, um, seem to be less addictive for whatever reason, something about their pharmacology than cannabis. The opiates are probably more addictive uh, than cannabis in a lab sense, but those are Again, um, I'm judging that just based on what the epidemiology is of, of our current arrangements of culture and, and policy, and that could be different, for example, if, if we ever marketed cannabis as aggressively as we have marketed tobacco. Thank you, Keith. And we'll have a question for Brian now. Go right ahead. So we have a question about uh, handling of informed consent discussions regarding medical marijuana advice and how to document informed consent. Um, and I guess there, there's a, a probably a medical and a legal approach to answering that question. I would start with a medical approach, uh, which is that basically, um, like any other medication, you want to consider risk and benefits. 
and probably even more than other medications, you want to discuss those with the patients in the, in the case of marijuana because it is so controversial. And as we discussed with the last question, um, there are risks of marijuana in terms of long-term exposure on a frequent basis. You certainly should mention that. Um, patients should be aware that there are carcinogens in, the medical, in marijuana smoke. Um, and then, of course, the same cautions that you would uh, give to any patient for whom you're prescribing a psychoactive drug about operating machinery, driving under the influence, those sorts of things. Um, in terms of documentation, you may have noticed the physicians in the audience in particular, the, the four steps or, or the six steps that the state of California recommends for uh, documenting uh, medical marijuana recommendations, they claim that those are the same as any other medication, but in fact, they're much more stringent than we usually follow for routine prescription. Very few physicians document a separate risk-benefit uh, analysis or discussion with specific prescriptions of antihypertensives or even pain medications. Um, but uh, the prudent physician would be well advised to at least document risks and benefits discussed when, pres when excuse me, not prescribing, when recommending medical marijuana. Thank you, Brian. Um, we have a question, and it's, what ways can a hospital respond to a patient who brings edible marijuana with them to the hospital? And this really uh, goes back to why it's so important for hospitals to anticipate that these discussions may need to occur, occur. and that's why you'd want to consult with risk management and your legal counsel to first understand what your organization's philosophy is going to be. Um, it's it's going to depend on what state you're in and what your guidelines are. But at the very least, it would be important to be able to discuss with the patient um, the legalities and the hospital policies um, surrounding the use of marijuana in the facility, which would go back to probably your um, medications brought from home. And, um, you know, so take it from there. And so I don't have a, a specific answer of what you can actually say to a patient. I can only provide you the considerations that should be made before you have that discussion. And I think Brian would like to add to that too. I would just add that along with the other considerations involved in medications from home, herbal and Eastern type medications, which we do sometimes allow patients uh, to take while they're in the hospital with certain precautions, with uh, ingestible marijuana, you just have to consider the intoxicating potential and have some sort of policy in place that if there's a problem with that, uh, that the, uh, the marijuana can be withdrawn from that patient. Okay, we have a question. It's, what is the top risk management issue facing hospitals regarding any recommended use of marijuana in the hospital setting? I would have to say that the top risk are the legal ramifications if you don't have guidelines and understanding about marijuana as an illicit substance under the federal law and medical marijuana under your state law and have education with your staff and physicians and understand your hospital policies. Not having all of those elements lined up um, could just lead to staff operating in uncertainty and could leave you open to some legal risk. So. That to me is the top risk, top risk management issue facing hospitals. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well this concludes the medical marijuana webinar. Thank you very much for attending. For further questions or if you would like to contact Stanford Risk Consulting, please email riskmanagement at stanfordmed.org. Again, thank you very much for attending and you may disconnect. <laughs>